special episode of the TFG1 podcast that will most likely be out Monday or Tuesday, which is the 13th and 14th of April. Um, I woke up from nap earlier this afternoon and said, hey, I don't actually know where This Week in Geek actually came from. So with me now at midnight is Mike the Birdman Dodd. Hello, Mike. Hey, Mike. How is it going? And to all you listeners out there in radio and podcast land. It's going good. Hopefully this recording can continue without any further issues, because we've already had one hang-up, not on either one of our parts. Skype dropped the call. Fucking eBay. Um, that. <laughs> uh, basically what we're going to do is I'm going to ask Mike a few questions, just kind of like what he usually does with guests on Twig, about kind of like a Inside the Actor Studio type thing. We're just going to have a general geek chat. Um... So, the first question is, even though most of us know you are from Canada, where did you grow up? Well, I originally grew up in a place called uh, Shallow Lake, but I spent a majority of my childhood in a, in a place called Owen Sound, Ontario, affectionately known as the elephant's asshole of, of Canada. If you look at it from a satellite view and use your imagination, you can see the wonderful place from which I spawned. <laughs> and you have a very vivid imagination. <laughs> oh, you bet I do. <laughs> What uh, what were some of your favorite cartoons and regular TV shows to watch as a kid? Well, I re remember watching a lot of Ninja Turtles when I was a kid, uh, X-Men. I didn't see a lot of Transformers, unfortunately, which really sucks. I had to wait until I was much older to see a lot of those. I was really into Thundercats, the real Ghostbusters, Care Bears, Inspector Gadget. Um, I'm trying to think. Most of the stuff that was on the early morning uh, CBS lineup before it got uh, screwed up, and a lot of the Fox cartoons, huge fan of the X-Men, uh, Spider-Man, and uh, the Silver Surfer. Yeah, uh, X-Men is coming to DVD, uh, official DVD release uh, from Disney this, I think, the 28th of this month. Uh, About friggin' time. It's coming uh, Volume 1 and Volume 2, which is a majority of the first two seasons episodes, I believe. I think it goes up, I think the two volumes go all the way up into the Phoenix Saga episodes. Uh, when did you first realize you were a geek, and what was the one thing, if you could pinpoint it, that made you a geek? I would uh, say probably the first time I got my Nintendo back in 1985. Um, my mom and my dad got me for Christmas a Rad Racer with the 3D glasses and the Load Runner. So I'm thinking, hmm, this is kind of cool. So I started playing around with that. The moment I realized I was a true nerd is when I annoyed the piss out of a friend of mine named Ryan in the eighth grade when I was talking endlessly about Mortal Kombat 3, and he told me to shut the hell up, and I'm thinking, wow, hmm, I think I'm on to something here. Oh, plus when I hacked my first satellite when I was a kid, uh, when I used to uh, surf the transponder channels around 3 o'clock in the morning looking for the feeds that were sent out to the affiliate stations for certain shows like X-Men and the X-Files. Uh -huh. um, when did you get into radio, and was it something that you always wanted to do? Well, it's actually kind of a funny story, kind of a roundabout thing. Um, I used to listen to this uh, station back at Owen Sound, uh, CFOS AM 560, and I used to just call into the DJs on Saturday nights. I was maybe... 10, 12 at this time, listening to them uh, spin oldies and stuff like that. My parents raised me on uh, oldies radio. And I met an older DJ there named Gary. And we just started talking on the phone. As time went on, we developed a friendship. I also uh, developed another friendship with a girl at the station. I think her name was Stephanie. And we just used to talk all the time. We just kind of chatted up. I was in grade 7 or 8. She was probably just fresh out of college and whatnot. So we just kind of chat there. And eventually I got a tour of um, 560 CFOS. And I decided, well, this is kind of neat. And I just kind of forgot about it for a number of years because I have a stuttering problem. <laughs> and I figured, you know what, I'm going to need to see a speech therapist, whatever. So I did throughout uh, probably until about grade 5 in school. And then I just kind of forgot about radio until uh, college actually came around. I uh, originally was supposed to go to uh, university for psychology when I was uh, younger, but I decided not to pursue that career path. Instead, I chose to get engaged, but uh, that ended, uh, well, badly in one sense, uh, not badly in an another, the fact that I'm where I am now. So I went to Niagara College when I was with my second fiance, 
and decided, you know what, I'm going to go to school for television. I was working for Rogers Communications at the time up in Owen Sound, uh, Channel 53, as a technical director and an audio director. So I was doing that, and then eventually I ran into my co-host, Steve Snowball Sailor. Hold on, hold on. I'm I'm sorry to stop you right there. That's a separate question. That's a separate story. Oh, okay. (laughs) I was going to ask that afterwards, but I guess you can go ahead and continue that story. I was going to ask, how did the snowball hit the bird man in the face? (laughs) Well, I tried to get him kicked out of school, actually. Oh, my God. Yeah, what happened is uh, we were taking a course in uh, in, uh, Niagara College. We had to do a, a presentation, and Steve's presentation was on computer security and he and there was a program that was developed and I don't know whether he did it or somebody else did it mm-hmm. that could steal information from the computers at school using a flash drive mm-hmm. and we got wind of this and we thought oh my god this guy's trying to steal the exams well first off good job second of all fuck you <laughs> <laughs> because we're having to work for these grades. So we decided, all right, you know what? We're going to have a talk. So anyway, actually, Steve just emailed me right now. That's kind of freaky. <laughs> um, so anyway, um, so eventually I own up to it. And Steve, I hear shopping around for a radio co-host. Turns out in, Ni- in Niagara College during the first year, you're allowed to do your own specialty radio show once you've had a year – or not a year – a semester of radio presentation under your belt. Oh. So Steve approached me because he knew I was huge in the Smallville and all these other nerdy things. Yes. And he's like, well, Mike, my original co-host bailed on me. Would you like the, would you like the job? Sure. <laughs> so I had some ideas for Twig, and it just kind of went on from there. And uh, – yeah, then me and Steve uh, did our first show January 27th or 29th of 2007, and it's uh, like we'd known each other for years. I mean, me and Steve had talked a handful of times outside of class, but uh, since that day, we were pretty much uh, inseparable. I mean, we only had like one or two classes together, but uh, every time there was a break or a spare, we were always in my room in res or just hanging out wherever, so. Yeah. That that actually kind of leads into the next question. Um, where did the idea for This Week in Geek come from? Can you kind of walk my listeners through the creative process you or Steve had with coming up for the idea? Well, the idea for Twig originally was a show kind of like This Week in Tech with uh, Steve's friend Leo Laporte. Mm-hmm. And then I decided, you, you know what, Steve? We don't have enough material. We're not experts in this field. So, you know what, why don't we focus on more nerdy and geeky things? And he's like, okay, well, that's kind of cool. And then we just started brainstorming in the cafeteria over a plate of fries, and we just started talking. And eventually the idea came the, uh, to fruition, and we did a five-minute demo of the show, and it just it worked out tremendously well. And then as the show progressed through the first season, uh, things just started to evolve. I started to take more of, a, a, of an executive producer control deciding in the segments and then i started making press contacts because i figured hey you know what we're technically legitimate media we're on a radio station we have a terrestrial broadcast wattage so why don't we expand out and offer some real news so i started contacting some uh, video game companies and some uh, dvd publishers to get review material and then things just kind of well to pardon the phrase snowballed from there (laughs) and then we started covering more events we covered uh the toronto fan x we covered uh the star wars event in welland for the uh 25th anniversary uh or 30th anniversary rather sorry uh we also did events we we actually raised some money in the first year for littlegeeks.org which is an organization run by uh Butterscotch.com owner and uh, technology journalist Andy Walker's uh, charity foundation, which provides computers to uh, children that don't have uh, internet access. So as time went on, I basically took more and more control of the show, working with CA to develop topics, ideas, segments. Then we started bringing in some of the other co-hosts onto the show, most uh, notably Pierce Dirks and uh, David Dennis, because uh, Dave and Pierce were some of my best friends in college. I figured, well, you guys are pretty funny. You're creative and we started working stuff out and i can't remember how we got on the idea of developing dave's rants <laughs> I, th- I, I think i just told him here dave talk about something stupid for like two minutes a show plus he is a good voice actor oh he is dave is is a tremendous talent in fact i'm actually dave's agent or i'm uh, going to officially be his agent uh, after he graduates school and uh gonna shop him around to the interweeb 
and uh, kind of see what happens with Dave. Because, yeah, he's a tremendous talent. Actually, um, for for This Week in Geek, uh, myself, Dave, and Pierce actually represent all three streams of the broadcasting program at Niagara College, whereas uh, Dave is a film major. Yeah. Pierce is, is a television major. I am a radio and television presentation major. Oh. So it's kind of weird. We represent all three streams, so we have all three unique talents to the listeners and the viewers of This Week in Geek. Now, my next question, it, it, it kind of doesn't apply because you've pretty much already told us where the whole idea came from, but because of my background as far as podcasting and stuff, the question is, did listening to podcasts get you into wanting to host them like I did with me, like as far as listening to you guys and a few other, or was it something else entirely, which you've kind of already answered? <laughs> Uh, Truth be told, Mike, I had no fucking clue what a podcast was until January 28th, the day after we did our first show. Steve's like, oh, Steve's like, oh, yeah, by the way, our show's going to be podcast. Podcast? What the fuck is that? (laughs) And uh, and then he told me about it, and our first episode was podcasted on uh, February 14th of uh, 2007, and then we – then yeah, we we went to this event in uh, Toronto called uh, PodCamp Toronto, and that was hosted by uh, one of the social media gurus, Chris Brogan. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, I started learning about this whole world of world of podcasting, thinking, oh my god, this shit's really cool. Yeah. And then it pretty much took over my life during last summer, or yeah, or sorry, 2007 summer took over my life because I was doing nothing but trying to produce episodes and reviews and everything. In the last two years. The show has absolutely taken on a life of its own just because that's all I do is I, I, I listen to podcasts, talk, uh, talk to social media people, uh, new media people, stuff like that. In fact, one of my best friends uh, I consider anyway is uh, Brent Morris, the uh, Closet Geek, uh, former host of the Closet Geek Show. He started getting me into all these different things, and then Steve finally roped me in the Twitter uh, in 2008's pod camp. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, by the way, it's at Birdman Dot if you're curious. Yeah, we can talk about Twitter a little bit later. That that was going to be another one of our discussion topics. But, uh, yeah, so it just uh, – that's how I found out about podcasting. Then I started talking to some other podcasters, and I started reading some of the books by, like, uh, Evo Terra, Podcasting for Dummies, Blogging for Dummies. And all that stuff. I mean, and I've been a long time blogger. I used to have a live journal I had for about six years, and I deleted that in uh, October of 2007, which sucks. I lost over 5,000 posts. Wow. Yeah, it was my entire life summed up, and I did it because uh, I was involved with my uh, ex fiance. She broke up with me on my birthday of all days. Ooh, that sucks. And. Oh, it did, and and I, I wrote in it for a little while, and then, like, I kind of decided one night, you know what, I don't want to be defined by what I was, I'm going to be defined by what I am, and then I, I guess I'm pretty much defined now by podcasting and some of the radio work that I now do. Yep. What is your favorite word? Oh, fuck. For sure. <laughs> <laughs> I was going to say, wait a second, that's two words. <laughs> Uh, I mean, let me tell you, the amount of times I drop that word in an average afternoon, it would astound you. In fact, I actually have a T-shirt, which I'm hoping will make it onto one of our videos. <laughs> and I got it from T-shirt Hell, and it says, I'm not here to impress none of you motherfuckers. <laughs> My favorite T-shirt. <laughs> what is your least favorite word? Um, Meh. If the- M-E-H. Every, that or the word whatever. Every time somebody says that, I want to hurt something innocent or punch something fluffy and cute. Uh, I, that to me is the, I, lowest, <laughs> the lowest denominator of human intelligence. The, the only it's, reason why I even use it is because of The Simpsons. That's the only reason why I ever use it. There was one scene in one show where um, – Lisa, right? Yeah, well, it, yeah, it was Lisa that said it, but Homer was trying to get her and Bart to do something, and they both said meh, and Homer's like, what? She goes, M-E-H, meh, and that, and just f- from seeing that episode, that's the, and that's why I, why I use it. I don't use it all the time, but I use it some of the time. One of my ex-girlfriends used to use that word so many times. It was literally maddening. I'm talking H.P. Lovecraft level of insanity. (laughs) 
Oh my god, I hate that fucking word. Anyway, go on. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> if there was one place you could visit in the entire world, where would it be and why? Uh... I don't know. I'm trying to think here. Where would I want to go? Probably New York City or Los Angeles. Well, uh, as for why, LA, aren't you? I'm going to LA for the Electronic Arts Expo. Yeah. But uh, so I guess New York, probably just to go visit for visit some friends, but mostly just to turn off my cell phone and wander around with my camera. Mike, you know you you will never turn off your cell phone. If you do, it's maybe like once for about two hours, and then that's it. And that's only because it, it's dead. <laughs> <laughs> if you could pick, uh, this goes back to the cartoon questions. If you could pick one cartoon as your number one all-time favorite, what would it be and why? Probably the X-Men cartoon by Fox. Just because it was so groundbreaking in the terms of what it told in terms of storytelling. It it was dramatic. It was great. It never It never took itself... Like, it was funny. Sure, there were funny moments, and occasionally there was a comedic episode, but the storytelling never wavered, and I always thought that was the beautiful part about Fox's X-Men, is that it never was afraid to have bad things happen. I mean, when Morph died, or came back in season two with Mr. Sinister, <laughs> it was really cool, but when the episode I remember the most was the Days of Future Past series arc, mm -hmm. and it was like two it was two, two episodes, episodes. Yep. And that was just friggin' fantastic, and that's the thing that really made me realize that animation is a true storytelling art. Yeah. And that's probably my favorite cartoon of all time, was the X-Men animated series. Yeah, I can I can agree with that, and I, and I think it has stood up over time, especially Absolutely. especially with them releasing the DVDs. I mean, at least we'll have it for, for all time. <laughs> Um, if you could, if you had to pick one number one all-time favorite TV show, this is not cartoons, TV show, what would it be and why? Hmm, that's kind of a tough one, considering I have so many favorites now. <laughs> um, hmm. Yes, we hear the CFG1 podcast ask hard-nosed questions. <laughs> 24 is definitely up there. Um, all-time favorite. Buffy the Vampire Slayer is another one? I'm thinking here. Oh, man, Jesus. <laughs> um, I'd say most recently, the show that's really got my attention and probably stands up there above all else for right now is Veronica Mars. Mm. That show is probably one of the smartest written shows I've ever come across. Kristen Bell was vastly underappreciated in that role. And Enrico Colatoni, who plays Keith Mars, uh, Veronica's dad, mm -hmm. was, I really think, underappreciated. Should he have received an Emmy of some kind? You know what? Maybe. Yeah. Because he had some really good roles in there. And Veronica Mars was just a great show. And it's even better in my opinion than some other shows I like I mean one girly show I like and love actually is the Gilmore Girls that was another fantastically written show which I got into because of one of my girlfriends at the time yeah. and uh, yeah so for right now I'm going to have to go with Veronica Mars 24 Gilmore Girls and then probably what's another big show I like uh, I don't know maybe the X-Files yeah I I never really get into X Files. Um, oh, that's because you suck. The show is amazing. I just don't. I don't do that. The 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 sci fi type of show type stuff like that. I don't know. It's just me. Anyway. Um, Yet you like giant robots. <laughs> shut up. There's a big difference between giant robots and bleeding green spewing aliens. You fool! They could bleed green. <laughs> the Quintessons bleed green. Uh. That's a yeah, that's right. That's a topic for an entirely different interview. <laughs> right. Um, now I have not read comics myself since I was probably about fourteen or fifteen. I had wrote down a question here. What are some of your favorite comics? Uh, some of my favorite comics. Um, I'm, it's actually kind of weird. I I've been floating in in and out of comics for years. Um, I'd say the comic I liked the most was the Dreamwave run of the Transformers comics. That really got me back into it. I actually went so far as to get all the variant covers for every issue almost ever, <laughs> ever, ever published. I'm missing maybe three or four issues. Um, I'd say, yeah, definitely that one. The G.I. Joe Declassified series on Snake Eyes, I think that was Dreamwave, was yet another series of comics I loved. Um, 
these they're not tied to any one publisher that I can remember. I think it's Nightmare Press, but I'm not 100 percent sure. Uh, it was the series of comics based on Freddy, Jason, and Leatherface. Oh. Love those. Love horror comics. Um, in addition to that, I also used to love reading the uh, Star Wars Clone Wars and uh, Knights of the Old Republic comics way back in the day. I actually remember the uh, Knight of the Old Knights of the Old Republic or whatever it was called, the Old Republic series of comics by Dark Horse, where uh, Elwick Keldroma turns to the dark side, and I remember having that issue when I was a kid. And uh, trying to think of another comic that really, really, really liked. Um. I, I, I liked the McFarlane run on Spider-Man. I remember seeing issue 300, which introduced Venom in stores when I, when I was a kid. Stupidly, I didn't pick it up. Um, Sonic the Hedgehog by Archie, actually, I thought was fantastic, especially the uh, the artwork by Spaz and Harvo. I thought that was really, really, really neat. And, uh, yeah, I'd say that pretty much sums it up for me and comics. Yeah, the... The follow-up question of that was, were you a, or are you, a huge Marvel or DC guy, or do you prefer an independent comic publisher? Well, I've got two tattoos in my body that pre- pledge my allegiance to Detective Comics, but at the same time, I like a lot of the smaller publishers. Like, I'm a huge fan of Devil's Due Publishing, and uh, they do a really fantastic series called Hack Slash, which is really, really, really neat. You guys should definitely check it out. Um... But if I had to fall on one side of the fence, I'd have to go DC because I find the storytelling, it's a lot better if somewhat convoluted. Like, they always retcon everything. Like, oh, Superboy Prime. Oh, he's not dead. Inf- Infinity Crisis on whatever. <laughs> and, yep, yeah, Marvel, if you want to follow Civil War here, buy episodes 1, 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 11, 14, and 9 of She-Hulk. And you know what I mean? It just... The crossovers got ridiculous, and that's why I'm not a huge fan of Marvel as much, but I like some Marvel characters. With one uh, exception, I'm going to say something very, very controversial right now. With one one exception, DC cannot produce a good movie for shit. Marvel owns them on movies. The only exception to that is The Dark Knight. I would, well, I'd say Batman Begins was really good. It was okay. Um, I didn't like the choice for the villain for that one, but that's just me. Yeah, I agree. It could have been a lot more iconic, but for what it was, it did set up the uh, universe. Yeah, it did, um, it did set up the Nolanverse. Uh, it's actually funny you talk about the crossovers. I don't know where. I think they're in the the other room. I have the um, all four original issues of the Marvel DC crossover, Marvel versus DC. I used to have that. I had. Uh, I think I had the second issue, and I also had the Adventures of Dark Claw. Yeah, which is. I think between those comics and the comic that I got with my BotCon 2008 set last year, those are the only comics I own right now. I'm sitting on about three boxes of comics right now, <laughs> not counting the countless uh, graphic novels I have <laughs> in our living room. In fact, actually, I just, I'm just getting into mangas right now. Uh, we just did a special on This Week in Geek on uh, 20th Century Fox's Dragon Ball Evolution. And uh, Viz, Viz Media, the guys that do the... Pokemon, Bleach, and all them sent us some of the Dragon Ball mangas, and I'm really, really digging those right now. That's cool. That's cool. Um, who is your favorite actor or actress? Wow, that's a toughie. Um, well, I'm not saying you have to, like, pick a definite... I mean, just, like... Ones that I favor? Yeah. Um, I'm really a huge fan of Kristen Bell. Like, ever since seeing Veronica Mars, that was absolutely just... Wow. Stalker. Um, oh... Like, you wouldn't believe. Um, uh, another one of my favorites is, she's a little lesser known, but yeah, you know her from the Sarah Connor Chronicles. Levin Rambin, she played the character of Riley Dawson. I really, really like her, actually. And I, I really think she's going to do some fantastic things in, like, Hollywood. I really, really think so. Um, as for actors, I would definitely say I'm a huge fan of uh, Carlos Bernard. He plays Tony Almeida on 24. Uh, Kiefer Sarland, Jack Bauer, clearly. Mm-hmm. Um, should I think of another character? I really like Frank Welker. Uh, Dean Hagland. Uh, he plays Langley on the X Files. Uh, David Duchovny. <laughs> just because I think he's brilliant and he's quite the comedic actor when he's given the chance to do something. Californication. Exactly. Um, Even though I've never the... seen it, the only reason why I know that is because Columbia House sent me a season of it and I sent it back. 
Very nice. <laughs> Actually, it's kind of weird. I sent for a Columbia House application a little while ago, gave them my credit card number, and I never saw anything. The best so the, the best way to get it done is if you find a Columbia House thing in a magazine. Like, you know, you, you, know, you have those little subscription cutouts in magazines for that magazine. Yep, yep. Find one of those and just send it in like like that and just, like, click the – or check off the bill me thing. And they'll, you know, they'll have you select two or three selections or whatever for the DVD club. Um, I can also give you the link to the DVD website. See, see, I actually did that, and I just never heard back from really? them. Really? Huh. Maybe my credit sucks. I don't know. So. <laughs> I don't know. Twig has certainly broken me. Um, We're gonna. I'm gonna save the last. Que- I'm gonna save the last question I have for the end of the the end of the little episode here, because I kind of want to get into like Twitter and stuff like that, and the last. Sure, sure. Last. Uh, question is about kind of like podcasting so um yeah twitter i think uh the the actress you mentioned from sarah Connor Con- Con- the from the terminator tv show that's another one of the shows i don't watch and i think the only time i've seen that actress's name is when you've twittered her on twitter i think you've s- sent several messages to her and i've seen those go through um yeah twitter's awesome i love it yeah, Twitter is one of those things. I used to make fun of Steve for using this. He's like, I'm going to Twitter this. I'm like, yeah, you fucking nerd. <laughs> and then uh, we went to uh, PodCamp in Toronto, and I'm like, all right, Twitter sounds cool. Let's sign up. And then, yeah, it's just just been one amazing tool. In fact, that's how I got my gig on 11.50 a.m. WIMA through uh, one of my friends. Her name is Denise Dorman, and she's the wife of Dave Dorman, who's a – world famous star wars artist he does all the oil paintings oh. for star wars and she hooked me up with with uh with uh some people over at uh, clear channel and it was just wow i'm like this is the power of social networking and then i just met so many really cool people over twitter obviously i talk to levin i talked to leo laporte uh, i talked to uh greg grunberg and all them so it's just it's really weird just to see the amount of people that are out there on twitter and how useful this thing is in fact uh another one of one of my friends and frequent uh, contributor to twig kyle a bear host of the big bald broadcast is on twitter and he does he was some of the voices for uh, dragon ball z he was the voice of uh Teen Gohan and the Dragon Ball Z announcer, and just seeing how he uses Twitter to engage his audience is really, really, really cool. And then obviously people like the Locker Gnome, Chris, Chris Prillo. In fact, I I knew him just before he got famous, which is really cool. <laughs> uh, he doesn't remember me at all. Um, but yeah, it was just it, I I just can't believe how much Twitter has exploded in the last uh, couple of months, and it's amazing because some people at my school we're like we're just all getting ready to graduate in the next couple of days and they're like oh twitter sucks blah blah blah, blah. and now i'm starting to see them pop up on twitter <laughs> yeah like that's right who the fuck's <laughs> laughing now i gotta say well, uh, the only yeah steve um snowball sailor had uh he, steve put up a um uh what did he do he oh he asked a question i think it was a couple months ago he asked a question on twitter about blogging and and you know between Facebook and MySpace and Twitter, what what do people use the most? And for me, I have a MySpace page. The only reason why I have it is because I want to be able to check up on some of my favorite bands like Nickelback and Lifehouse and just you know bands like that type of deal, just to see what's going on with them. I don't use it for anything else other than that anymore. I check up on some of my friends that post on there, but I very rarely will post any blogs or do anything with it. Facebook, I only join that to um, uh, my 10-year high school reunions actually next month, uh, and I only join that to get in touch with some of my old high school friends. And Twitter, I use that more often than not. I, mean, I use Facebook more often than, yeah, than I, I do. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I... Uh, yeah, Twitter is just – it is so much easier whether you're using the website, whether you're using one of the mobile apps. TweetDeck is awesome. It just is. I have it. I just haven't played with you, it yet. You need to because it is almost instantaneously. It's not like where you – like if you're on Twitter.com and you say, oh, at Steve Saylor, uh, da, 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 you know, email me, whatever, you know, update. And then you have to refresh to see if he's if he's replied to that message. You have to refresh the web page. 
With TweetDeck, it's like instantaneously, whenever a message comes in, whether it's a general message from somebody that you're following, whether it's a direct message for you, whether it's a reply to you, it comes in as soon as they send it. See, I use Twitter Fox, and that seems to work just as well. It's just not as robust, I guess. TweetDeck's awesome. <laughs> Um, let's see. But, uh, by the way, Mike, you'll be happy to know, or probably unhappy, rather, that uh, Nickelback in Canada is actually considered noise. Yeah, well, you people don't know what good music is, then. You've got to be friggin' <laughs> kidding me. <laughs> See the video to Rockstar? That's... Okay, no, no, wait, wait a second here, wait a second. Production value in the toilet. Now, I will, I will openly admit, I am not a fan of Rockstar, okay? They peaked after Silver Side Up. They peaked. I don't think so. My personal opinion is they keep getting better. Now I man, I gotta introduce you to to some good music, my friend. <laughs> okay. Go to sixty one dot com and just listen. Yeah. Um, when I first found them, I found them in two thousand, right when uh, the state premiered, when Leader of Men and Breathe were the two biggest hits they had. And I was like, oh, okay, this is really cool, really cool. I started listening to it. This is back before I got into iTunes and all that stuff and before the whole digital media thing kind of kicked off full blast. And then Silverside Up came out, and, yeah, I liked a lot of the songs. My main problem with radio in general is they overplay everything. That's because you're likely listening to a top 40 format station. That would be my guess. Well, rock station, I mean, just, just a regular, you know – rock station not really top 40 because the top 40 station here mainly plays rap and hip-hop but anyway um so yeah silver side up came out and there's a lot of songs that didn't get any play off of that that are really good like hollywood and woke up this morning and all that and then the long road came out and i enjoyed pretty much every track that wasn't a uh, single i really enjoyed a lot um and then All the Right Reasons, again, I usually look for the tracks that aren't the singles. Like, uh, the one I can remember that I listened to the most off of All the Right Reasons was Next Contestant. Um, and then Dark Horse Hit and love it. But anyway, you know, to each their own. They suck. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> uh, I can say that because I'm Canadian, yeah, okay? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Actually, it's funny. I'm not going to I'm not gonna say names or anything else, but uh, on the Earth2.net forums, there is a, a guy over there that apparently, um, he, he's a musician, and apparently he had a set either before or after Nickelback, before they got famous, and some bar fight broke out or whatever else, and he ended up hitting Chad Kroger in the back of the head. And I actually saw Chad Crozier at a hockey game about four years ago. Oh, really? Yep, he was uh, sitting up in the press boxes. Uh, I was at an Ottawa 67s game. Mm -hmm. um, there's been a lot of speculation, because um, I, I started a 24 thread over at Earth2.net, and there's been a lot of speculation as far as this season where Jack might end up, where the show might end up if he does not, if Sutherland does not come back. And somebody said, I think, I think Tony could take over, and I'm like, uh, yeah, okay, that's not going to happen. It wouldn't be the same show without Kiefer Sutherland. It would totally tank if it didn't I, have him. I don't think so, because there were rumors that Tony Almeida was going to get his own spinoff for a while there. And the thing is, Jack Bauer's already signed on for an eighth season. He'll yeah. he'll be back. Oh, yeah, and I'm sure. And I think it was about a month ago, I kept, like, f for a solid week, I kept asking the question, and nobody answered it. I am surprised. I kept asking the question on Twitter. In a fight, who would win, Jack Bauer or Vic Mackey? Who the fuck is that? Vic Mackey from The Shield. Oh, well, Jack Bauer, because he's Jack Bauer. You're just a Jack Bauer stalker, that's all it is. Jack Bauer can kill <laughs> Okay. Uh, uh, you might not want to say that standing too, so close to a lightning rod. <laughs> Jack Bauer will own you. Jack Bauer is the only man on earth that, that can simultaneously kick the ever living shit out of Chuck Norris and Jean Claude Van Damme. God's most two perfect creations. Jack Bauer created God, okay? Oh, my, oh Lord. You're really opening stuff up now, Mike. Oh, geez. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, In Jack. I think we're going to wrap this up with my last question. 
If you could give any advice on podcasting, what would it be, and what would you tell a potential podcaster to start with? Lots of naked chicks. Um, the, however, alternatively, my real advice is make sure you have the right training behind you. Passion will take you far. Passion will lead you to to education. But I think the best thing about podcasting is if you have a formal radio background, it can be tremendously helpful to you. And don't be afraid to try for really big interviews. I mean, sometimes you get tremendously lucky. And if you have a little bit of radio background to yourself, you can offer your audio skills up to radio stations much like I have, and that opens up a whole new set of doors and credentials that you can use to help promote your podcast, promote yourself, and develop as a radio professional. But in terms of, of, of podcasting, content has to be good. Content has to be consistent. That's why on Twig we have something come out literally every other day or every two days. There has to be something out because it keeps people it keeps people engaged. Some people say it's information overload. But that depends. I mean, you're delivering content on demand. It's not overload if they're choosing when to listen to it. Exactly. And if it's a, if it's a thing of like, like for example, I can go through the episodes I have of Twig that are on my iTunes, because uh, there are some that I just don't listen to because I may not like the topic or just I don't know. But like the best example I can give you is the Disney Afternoon one. I was so, as soon as I saw the download, I'm like, wow, they actually they're doing something really cool. And I listened to it, and uh, a friend of mine on Twitter, um, Atrion84, um, actually listened to it, and he it actually inspired him. He wants to start his own podcast, um, which he and I are probably going to do it together. It is going to be called Tooncast, and we are going to sit down and review one cartoon show or series each week, um, and that will be coming, I don't know when, at some point. Uh, ooh, I missed a question. Where... Where Where is it? Holy crap. I can't even find it now. Uh, we all know you're a huge Transformers fan. Where did that fandom start for you? Um, Actually, it's kind of funny. Uh, my friend Ryan, uh, not the same Ryan that told me to shut the fuck up, but a different <laughs> Ryan. We were watching YTV in Canada one night, and we saw this space battle uh-huh. on TV. We are like, what the hell is this? And it turns out it was Beast Wars. Uh. So I started getting into that with Ryan, and we, he would tape the shows for me off of YTV, and I'd watch them when he was done with them. And, yeah, that reignited my whole Transformers fandom. Then I found the movie uh, really cheap in, like, a store, and I bought it. Yep. I'd say my fandom really came alive when the Alternators came out. And I collected almost all of them. I'm missing, like, maybe five or six of them. And that really got me back into the fandom. And then uh, I, I, I guess I got more into it as the Michael Bay movie got closer and closer. And then when I got my Transformers tattoo, it was just, you know what? You're a Transformers fanboy. Just live with it. And, uh, I'm going to ask what actually... is it, but I'm not going to ask where is it. <laughs> oh, it's the Autobot logo, and it's on my left bicep right below Superman. Okay. I'm also going to get the Decepticobra symbol. I just don't know where yet. Because <laughs> that's just friggin' badass. Oh, that's that's too funny. <laughs> All right. Do you have any uh, parting words of wisdom or any weird or strange geek stories that you want to share with us? I'm trying to think here. Where do I even start here? I guess words of wisdom is don't ever give up. If someone says you're not going to be a success, give them the finger, punch them in the face, and prove them wrong. Because you know what? Everybody who laughed at me at Niagara is regretting it now. Yeah, I bet they I've are. had I, – you would be surprised, Mike, how many times I have people emailing me going, oh, my God, Mike, what do I do? I, I need help. <laughs> but the thing is, the most important thing is don't be a dick. Like Will Wheaton said, don't be a dick. <laughs> but – the most – like when you communicate with people that maybe laughed at you for being a podcast or laugh at you for being a nerd, be very gracious with them because it means you're the better person. Now, that's not a superiority complex thing, not at all. It's you being gracious in light of what's happened. It's all about good good karma. So when you help another person out, no matter what, it will come back to you in some way. Don't do it for selfish reasons because, hey, I'm going to get a – reward someday do it because you want to be a a good person and i guess that's the most important thing is 
is that just be good. What you give to the world, you will get back in spades. And I guess there's something else that really changed my life, and I guess I'll just share it right now. Sure. Is I is I did this thing last summer called the Landmark Forum, and it's uh, landmarkeducation.com. And I went to this uh, seminar in Toronto for three days. My friend Andy Walker paid for it. And it was the most amazing, life-changing thing I have ever done in my life. Literally over the course of three days, I regained my life. And it I guess to boil it down, it teaches you to accept responsibility for everything that you have ever done, both good and bad, but know that you're perfect just the way you are. And the only obstacles that are ever in your way are the ones that you place there yourself. So whenever you say, oh, I can't do that because I, I, I'm not good enough, that's a story you're telling yourself. You are as talented as you need to be. If you want to do it bad enough, you'll do it. And with that stuff in mind, just things changed. And Twig has experienced a remarkable growth since then. I mean, we were a small podcast. Now we're a podcast of over 3 million listeners yeah, from that's, last summer. That's crazy. That's, that's really good, though. That's, it's really cool. Uh, like I've been spotted in Toronto. People going, "Oh my God, it's Birdman!" <laughs> I, I had a couple of girls pose with me for like photos last year at the Toronto Fan X because we did shows on Evil Dead the Musical and some other stuff. They're like, "Hey, my God, you're really cool!" And you're Mike Dodd, Screw Attacks G One of the Year. And <laughs> oh, that's another adventure too. <laughs> Spe Screw Attack and the Game Heroes. Yes. Uh, speaking of the convention stuff that you have done, are you guys going to TFCon this year? When is it and where is it? It's in Toronto. I don't know when though. Um, oh, um, it depends. If it's the same weekend as as uh, as like Anime North, probably not. Okay. Um, I would like to go this year because I have the voice of a uh, Generation One Bumblebee there. Yes, yes. Just I'd love to get some promos from him. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, I'm not sure the c conventions were uh, hitting this year. I'm doing E3 likely this year. I'm uh, probably doing. Well, I missed I missed New York Comic Con, but Pierce went this year. Mm. Uh, probably going to E3, probably Evo, which is this huge fighting game tournament in Las Vegas. Are you going back uh, to Iron Man of Gaming? Oh, for sure. I actually, well, which is now called SGC Screw Attack Gaming Convention. Oh, okay. Um, if you keep your eyes on ScrewAttack.com, sometime in the next little while, you're going to see a challenge between Jose and myself, or as I now call him, Jose El Mexitaco. <laughs> it's uh, it's going to be intense, and I intend to win this challenge. And that's all I can really say, so I'm not going to spoil it. But uh, <laughs> cheer for the Birdman. He's got Jack Bauer on his side. <laughs> Do you have any uh, Twig exclusives that you might be able to uh, share with us that no one else really knows about yet? Well, um, I actually just recently did an interview with uh, with Levin Rambin, uh, one of the stars of the uh, Sarah Connor Chronicles. I also did a really cool bit on Birdman's Boombox with Entity and Ranger of the 8-Bit Boys. They're these nerdcore rappers, which are quite friggin' awesome. Um, in addition to that, uh, we're just working on a really bunch of really exciting shows. I'm hoping to get some more really big guests on the show. And in fact... There may be a video I'm going to be in in a couple of weeks that might feature some rather big internet stars. We're filming it in Chicago on Monday, so cool. that's all I can really tell you. It, uh, it'll be pretty amazing. All I can say, he's uh, going to take you back to the past, and he remembers it so you don't have to. <laughs> that's all I can say. But, uh, uh, other I already than that, think I know who it is. It'll be pretty frigging awesome. So uh, hopefully I'll be there with one of my uh, motherfucker T-shirts. So. <laughs> um, last time you were doing exclusives for us, you had mentioned the Twig TV show. Is there any de more development on that? Well, uh, since that time, we have parted ways with the interested party, mainly because he was a douchebag. <laughs> uh, <laughs> But we are working on developing some new television properties, which we're going to approach uh, some of the Canadian media people, hopefully in the next few months, once we flesh out the pilot, uh, maybe film a short segment of it. Uh, actually, right now, we're working for the uh, for the, the Pones Game Center here in Hamilton. That's uh, P-O-N. 
P-O-W-N-Z.com, and we're doing all their, like, fight videos right now. So there may be a possibility of Twig getting on Xbox Live cool. from the uh, from the Pwns Game Center. So, yeah, you never know. In fact, uh, if you look on Xbox Live right now, Twig is on there twice. We're at the... Um, we're at the Gears of War events. We're at the Halo, at the Halo Wars launch event, and we're in some, we're in something else. Yes, you can see me in the background quite clearly. <laughs> yes, you guys were also blogged about at G4, and can you talk about that at all? As far as maybe oh. Twig taking G4 over? <laughs> actually, it's kind of funny you mentioned that. Uh, somebody on uh, Twitter actually was following me from G4. And I mentioned, you know what, man? Twig's going to take G4. You friggin' watch. And the guy contacted me, and he's like, hey, how would you like to be featured on G4? I'm like, oh, really? Do tell. Let's have a conversation. <laughs> so, we, so we basically started talking back and forth, and he's like, well, I really like what like you guys do. Consistent content, really good content. Can we put you guys on the feed? I'm like, sure. So he did that, and we've been talking back and forth. And I'm going to approach them about some other ideas and development projects i have in mind so you never know i I think twig's really really going to go somewhere with this and with that in mind it would be awesome if we were on attack of the show x play ep daily or something like that i've got some pretty big ideas in fact i'd love to interview uh adam sessler or morgan webb (laughs) from from g4 just to talk to them about their experiences as as video game journalists that would be a flip uh, side seeing as how they do most of the interviews it would be. I mean, and supposedly Sessler is a really, really, really cool guy. My boss over at thegameheroes.com, Handsome Tom, was uh, talking with him last year and said he was a really chill guy. So yeah. hopefully. Yeah, hopefully. You never know. Oh, exactly. Right. So uh, right now Twig is uh, pretty much just getting bigger and bigger and bigger. You can hear me on 1150 AM WIMA on the Mike Miller Morning Show. We're on ScrewAttack.com, TheGameHeroes.com. And pretty much we're all over the net in some capacity. I know Steve's doing some blogging for techstartups.com. I think that's the name of the website. Yeah. He's also uh, doing Jump the Shark, which finally premiered. <clears throat> yeah, which sucks because we lost two of our episodes, which we recorded prior, which means we just have to re- rework them now that those shows are later in their respective uh, seasons. Um, but yeah, so I'm really, really, really happy Steve's doing that. So Steve does that. Uh, Dave is going to be doing more fan service stuff, more interviews yeah. in the next little while. Uh, we're actually talking about a new Twig audio drama, very similar to the Wrong Guy, Wrong Time thing that we did last year. So, we're, uh-huh. which was one of our technical marvels. <laughs> like I said, I really wish we'd won an award for that one at our school. But it came down to politics, in my opinion. But I'm not a sore loser. The best person won, so whatever. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I guess that's really about it. Oh, and Stefan the Skunk Pelche, well, he's just kind of there. <laughs> We're hoping to get him more involved in some stuff. In fact, uh, I was very happy he was my co-host on the most recent episode of the Dragon Ball yeah, the thing. Dragon Ball. I was going to say, Pierce has been the one that's kind of disappeared for a while. It's like you all sent him to Saskatchewan or something. No, Pierce has been tremendously busy with the uh, with the uh, with the uh, Bloor Street Cinema in Toronto. In fact, all the really good-looking videos on YouTube involving the Bloor Street Cinema have been Pierce, and uh, he's been working with uh, director Edgar Wright, who did Shaun of the Dead and Hot Fuzz, and is right now doing Scott Pilgrim Takes Over the World in Toronto. So hopefully, uh, some cool things will come out of that for Pierce. But uh, he's just been working with all them. They were doing this Right Stuff Film Festival in Toronto. In fact, tonight they're doing uh, David Cronenberg's, uh, I think it's The Brood or Last Night. I can't remember which which like one it is. And uh, something else there. It's uh, The Bloor Double Bill. So that's what he's been doing. He's just been really, really, really busy. Me and him still do Trauma Cast for Trauma Entertainment. But uh, Uncle Lloyd's terribly busy and so are we. So yes. we're – we're going to do more trauma cast stuff. I think the next episode is Sergeant Kabuki Man, NYPD, or uh, Redneck Zombies. Oh, uh-huh. Um, not too sure. <laughs> well, uh, I'd like to thank you for joining me, Mike. Uh, I'm just going to go over um, some of the stuff that's going on with me before we close this out. Uh, let's see. TFG1 podcast is up to... Steve and I are going to be recording episode 13 in about um, four hours. Uh, let's see. Um, I've actually had amazing, amazing response to TFG1. It, it, it's actually surprising. I know a few of the people that 
are over at earth2.net where I first asked uh, for feedback for um, the podcast about starting it up and stuff. A few of them listen that are overseas. I actually had one guy from Japan Twitter me the other day about it. Uh, so I've kind of gone worldwide with that. Um, Steve and I are Steve uh, SCP21 or at SCP21 on Twitter. He and I are still doing all things Transformers. We are going to be starting up at the end of this year uh, the Beast Unleashed podcast, which is uh, a review series for Beast Wars and Beast Machines. Um, let's see, what else are we going to be doing? Uh, the M-Wire Movie Week in Review is going to start July 11th, and I think, hopefully, if I can nail him down to the floor, I am going to have uh, Steve Snowball Sailor on that with us, because the premiere episode of M-Wire will be Back to the Future. And seeing as how you all recorded yours while Steve was in class, he can at least get his thoughts out on ours. <laughs> are you still there? Oh, yeah, okay. sorry, I... <laughs> Uh, reading stuff, that's all. <laughs> okay, I was going to say, wait, did he hang up again? Oh, shit. <laughs> um, yeah, and then I had already mentioned Tooncast. Uh, that'll be coming out. I don't know exactly when because I have to talk to my buddy about that. So, yeah, there's a lot going on for me as well. So, um, I think we're going to close that out. Close this out. Uh, that is all for this episode of the TFG One podcast. Join Steve and I next time when we review, when we will be reviewing five more episodes from Transformers Generation One Season Two. Those being the Key to Vector Sigma Parts One and Two, Aerial Assault, War Dawn, where we will meet uh, Orion Pax, and let's see if anybody knows who's or who Orion Pax is. And Trans Europe Express, which is basically just the Autobot run in Europe. Um, so thank you for joining me on the TFG1 podcast. There are four ways to get in touch with me or leave feedback for the podcast. The first is you can visit the PredaconEmpire.com forums and get all of your Transformers discussion topics there. The second is that you can follow me on Twitter. My Twitter name on there is TFG1 Podcast, as well as you can follow Mike, which his is at BirdmanDodd. The third is you can visit the Earth2.net forums. I have a thread over there under the banter section for the podcast. And the fourth is the email address, which is tfg1podcast at gmail.com. In the immortal words of Optimus Prime, transform and roll out, and thank you for listening. Yippee-ki-yay, motherfuckers! <laughs> Good night, folks. Start this over. Okay. Okay, and we are recording now, finally. This is the second segment of the TFG1 interviews where I interview the co the major co-hosts, even though, no disrespect to the other guys, the major co-hosts of Twig Mike the Birdman Dodd was in the earlier clip, and now I have, hopefully, Steve Snowball Sailor. Hey, 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 how's it going? It, it's going. I'm about ready to throw this computer out the fucking window. <laughs> oh yeah, and, uh, I hear you. And Steve, don't don't be bashful about cursing because uh, my podcast is tagged explicit. So, oh wow, well, that's right. <laughs> uh, so we all know that you're from Canada. Where exactly did you grow up? I grew up in a uh, city in the Niagara Peninsula called St. Catharines, Ontario, and uh, the, the Ontario is a province, not the city. Uh, but the, the thing is, what's cool about St. Catharines is its claim to fame is uh, the school that you see in the movie A Christmas Story, uh, you know, where the kid wants the Red Rider be begun for Christmas. Yep. Yeah, that school is in St. Catharines. <laughs> well, most of the good filming stuff is in Canada anyway. Exactly. <laughs> uh, yeah, we had talked in one of our previous attempts about uh, Skylon and all that stuff, and I remember going there and seeing that little, um, my dad stood behind a little plastic uh, Niagara Falls in a barrel thing. We had a picture taken. That was really cool. Yeah, me and my uh, dad had the same thing. Uh, that was in uh, Niagara Falls because the thing is that the whole area has changed now. It's become more commercialized and industrial, and it just has all kinds of, like, Buildings that are built up all around the falls, and it, it, it like it definitely is not the same as when you uh, when you were a kid. Like I have to say, like if you ever take a look at Superman two, um, whenever when Christopher Reeves basically uh, mm -hmm. like they're at uh, Niagara Falls, that whole kind of side area where you see like a lot of grass and a hill and all that stuff. It's oh yeah, that's anymore. all. It's it's pretty much all buildings from that point on. Oh, that sucks. Um, what got SteveSailor.net started up? What was behind, what was the whole thought process of yours behind that, behind your website? 
Well, uh, Steve Soda and I originally started off as a blog um, that I wanted to do just because I, I wanted to learn how to write, and I figured the good way to do that is to build a practice. So I originally was going to do a blog a day, a blog post a day for an entire year. Um, I originally it was I, I kind of scaled that down. It's like you know what, I'll just try to do a blog a day and see how long I can take it can take me. Um, I originally got up to about half an, uh, to about at least a full month. So I was kind of pretty proud about that. And then and then it went into uh, I, I moved it over to Vox.com. I used I used to intern at uh, G4 Tech TV, and then I got a beta invite for Vox.com, uh, uh, which is owned by Six Apart. And I had my blog there for uh, quite a while. I really loved it, and it was uh, it was easy to do. Uh, and it just I had my basically my domain name forwarded to there, uh, and then it started. Basically, I brought it back to. Um, it, I actually started up a podcast novel, and I figured the best way to be able to promote the novel was actually using my own name as uh, basically branding myself. So I, um, so I used the domain name Steve to, and I uh, launched uh, uh, the podcast novel Black Shadow through that. And then it kind of basically reiterated my, uh, to more of a formal kind of a blog, and then it kind of is now more of a formal, I guess, media-centric website. It's uh, um, it's been, basically it's been going since I think about 2004, somewhere in there. I think about 2004. So about f- it's been going for about five years now, and uh, uh, yeah, it's been, it's it's been a pretty fun ride for Steve Yeah, that's you know five years is a great accomplishment. Mm-hmm. Um, what were some of your favorite cartoons and regular TV shows to watch as a kid? Uh, well, we we kind of covered a, a little bit of this on on uh, Twig uh, in a recent episode. We did we talked about the Disney Afternoon. Mm-hmm. Uh, those were uh, absolutely my favorite uh, shows when I was when I was a kid. I mean, anything from Darkwing Duck, Tailspin, Ducktales, Goof Troop. Uh, gargoyles. Those were basically uh, my my favorite shows uh, growing up. Uh, there was also some kind of some really o- other different kind of shows. Like even though I grew up in the '80s, I never really got into the TV shows of the '80s. I wanted to, but uh, I just never like I was I was actually more of a like believe it or not. Even though I was a, a geek at the time, I still enjoy playing outdoors. So I never really got to um, do anything else other than to play outdoors with my friends for like hours upon end. So a lot of TV shows I did I didn't get a chance to watch. Uh, but other st- like other than that, I think it was. Was, um, uh, I did watch a little bit of Transformers, uh, not too much, but uh, I, I did get into it to a, a small, small degree. Uh, then what else? Uh, what else did I used to watch? Uh, oh, there was one show that it was never really, uh, that never really kind of. I don't think not a lot of people know about, but it was along. The, it was around the same time as the Disney Afternoon, and it was a show. It was a cartoon called Bruno the Kid. And uh, Bruno the Kid was basically like this little kid who became a super spy, and he, the, the kid, Bruno, uh, it was his name, and and he actually was voiced by Bruce Willis. Oh, that's cool. So yeah, so I w- uh, that was one another one of my uh, favorite shows uh, growing up. So yeah, it was just mainly it was mainly the Disney Afternoon. I, I grew up kind of a very uh, sheltered kind of childhood, so it was. Uh, it was just mainly those were the shows that I got to watch, and, and obviously like other stuff like Saved by the Bell and. And uh, all those kind of uh, sh- shows that you would see on uh, like Saturday afternoon or what we used to call the TGIF, yeah. uh, TGIF Friday. So yeah, that was pretty much my shows. Yeah, I um, actually it's funny you mention about uh, not watching Transfers too much. You will actually be able to. You you'll have to import them from the U.S. But Shout Factory has been uh, tapped to release the original '80s cartoon on DVD again. Uh, they're going to do a 25th anniversary season one coming June 16th, a week before the Transformers Revenge of the Fallen movie, and they are going to be doing a complete series later on in the summer, so you should definitely oh, cool. get those. I'm uh, definitely going to have to give those a try. Yep. When did you first realize you were a geek, and what was the one thing, if you could pinpoint it, that made you a geek? Uh, actually, this one's quite easy. Um, I mean, I was, I pretty much was like a, a geek growing up, but the one, uh, moment that I kind of pinpointed a real, uh, like self-realization of when I was a, a geek, uh, was when I, I used to sit at home, like, and now I, I specifically saved the, the, this, because it was a TV show, and I specifically saved it for this particular, uh, kind of question. Uh, it was actually Star Trek The Next Generation. Uh, I used to I used to watch that like relentlessly when I was a kid. I was a major Star Trek geek. I was never gotten to the point where I would dress up uh, as, uh, as like uh, with the costumes and stuff like that. Um, but I had I had the uh, Star Trek little action figures or the TNG action figures. Uh, I think I had Picard. I had Geordi. I had Worf. 
Um, I, I think I had Wesley Crusher. I couldn't ever remember if I had him or not. Uh, but I also one of my favorite toys was basically was the uh, uh, it was the tricorder. I actually had an, a working tricorder that was it was so cool. It was like kind of handheld and it was just I could push buttons on it and it was it was really cool. But uh, yeah, I remember watching that. Uh, it was funny because my my uh, mom and my dad would watch the show with me, and I remember watching like every single week whenever a new episode would uh, would uh, come out. And it was just like it was when I like when I when the TNG finished, and that's when I found out about basically about DS9 and and uh, Voyager soon afterwards. Uh, that like that's what for me. Uh, because I would never wa- I never would have watched those shows if it wasn't for TNG, and I became a huge geek because of that. I learned everything about Star Trek. I even had uh, read novels. I read comic books. Um, I even like uh, I would watch like all the old movies. Like this is before like TNG actually made any of the, uh, any movies, and this is around the time like still when like the I think Undiscovered Country was still was just coming out at that point uh, when TNG was still around. So it was it was quite cool to be able to uh, to see that, and it just yeah. So back in the eighties, late late eighties, that's when I really started becoming a geek, and then I kind of somewhat uh, fell out of it uh, as far as a geek kind of shows other than the Disney afternoon, but I never really considered those as geeky shows. It was just more about like just cartoons I would watch. And it, it wasn't until like into, um, when I got out, we graduated from high, like graduated from high school. That's when I really started getting into other, other branches of geekdom. And I started learning a lot, like a lot about movies, TV shows, comic books, video games, that kind of deal. So cool. it's been a long journey. Yes, it seems like it. And you're not that, you're not that old actually. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's weird because it's like yeah, I was. I mean, I'm only like uh, I'm only 25 years old. It's it, it, like yeah, I I know a lot of geeks would basically like uh, who grew up in the 80s as much as I did. They would chastise me for not be, being able to love like uh, like the geeky stuff back in the 80s, like Thundercats or Transformers or uh, anything. Like, yeah, He Man or anything along those along the, or Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, even to a certain degree. Like a lot of those stuff, like I, I never really got into. I mean, because uh, I was more into the sci-fi. I loved sci-fi because my dad had this uh, had the same. He loved like all the old sci-fi uh, movie, like sci-fi B movies, uh, anything like from Godzilla to uh, like Vincent, any Vincent Price movie, uh, as well as he used to watch uh, like uh, all, even what got me into comic books was also uh, was the old Batman series yeah. uh, in the '60s. Uh, that's also a show I used to watch, like the, the '60s Batman, the animated series, and yeah. uh, it was just a, kind of a. Uh, it just I learned, uh, got into my geekdom in the '90s, which uh, yeah. which kind of sucks because I, I kind of wish I was around for like a lot of the times in the '80s for all the go- cool stuff that happened then. But um, now nah, I just it just it was the '90s for me. Yeah. Um, the next couple of questions I kind of want to separate them a little bit because there's a question in between the one about where this week in geek came from mm-hmm. that I want to ask separate. So if you can kind of just like go with the flow on this, and I'll kind of tell you what. First question sure. is when did you uh, when did you get into radio and was it something that you always wanted to do? I originally didn't want to do radio. I was never really. I mean, I kind of had like in the back of my mind one of those things. It was I I would love to be able to someday maybe be a radio DJ and I, and it just was not, never grew anything more than just that. Uh, never really pursued it any further. But uh, it was in two thousand three. Uh, I was uh, I was. I got into a beta invite for the Matrix Online uh, role playing game, and it was uh, it was my first kind of MMORPG that I got to uh, get into. And when I started playing it, I found out about a online radio station for the game called the Radio Free Zion. And this was actually one of the it was the kind of not necessarily the, the officially declared the official radio station of the matrix online mm-hmm. um but it was like warner brothers knew who we uh, who it was uh who the station was and they were basically they would give us like special invites and special codes to give away and we'd also have like uh developer interviews that only go through uh, uh through radio free zion stuff like that and i they had p- uh, position availability for for online djs I thought, you know what? What the hell? I mean, I kind of, I like, I love the game uh, a lot, and I thought I had a, a pretty good personality to be able to be a DJ. So I just started. I applied, and they, uh, and they said I was, I said I was good. So I started uh, doing that, and then I, I was doing that for about a year and a half, uh, roughly. And that, when I started, like, it was about six months into doing the, um, 
uh, to doing uh, being a DJ that uh, I I, re- I I got the I got the bug for uh, for being on radio. Uh, I think it, I actually remember the exact moment. It was uh, I was doing a show, and the thing is, at the time, Radio Free Zone would throw the they had these dance clubs in the game that you can go to, and we we would always the anytime we would have a party or a cl- like a thing on on the station, we would always show up at the clubs and basically host parties. And we had this one. I can't remember. Uh, I'm I'm blanking on the name of it right now. It's like I think it was like worldwide uh, worldwide rave. I think it was what it was called. It was basically across all of servers, and it was just the biggest uh, dance party for the Matrix Online, and we were hosting it. And I was the first DJ to run the bl- uh, first like two hour block of this. Uh, worldwide rave. So, and the thing is, this was like I think my second uh, shift on air. And what was uh, it was kind of funny because it, it was the lar- it was the that night was the largest listenership we ever had. And uh, from it was on my show, and it was about over two thousand listeners live listening at that point. And it was really really cool. I got a huge uh, uh, po- uh, positive response from that. And I, yeah, I, I pretty, much, I, I caught the bug pretty much from there. And then, and then I went to school at Niagara College for uh, radio, film, and television broadcasting. And I wanted to focus in on the radio thing. And then I, pr- it pretty much gone from there. And now I'm at Humber College because they, uh, uh, Niagara College kind of uh, handles more film and television than they, do, than they do really radio. But uh, yeah, so I'm at Humber College specifically right now in Toronto for radio broadcasting and. Uh, I've been on like AM640, which is like the largest radio station here, in, well, one of the largest radio stations in Canada. Uh, I've interned there, and uh, just yeah, it's been. It, I love radio. I just love it to death. That's cool. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, where did the idea for this week in Geek come from? Can you kind of walk the TFG1 listeners through the creative process you had for coming up with the idea? Uh well originally it was it, it originally actually started off with me uh I wanted to I, like I knew going into the program that they would uh they do for special credit uh for basically for five percent uh, bonus credit for the radio production class uh we were allowed to if we wanted to do a specialty show on the college radio station uh just uh, uh like you would do it on your own time you would run it for about an hour's uh, about an hour show. And originally, I was going to do it as a. Uh, I don't know if you know uh, know this is, but basically, I used to be. Um, I used to love watching uh, tech TV back in the day, and I would, uh, I would li- watch like Leo Laporte on the screensavers and call for help. And he had a radio show called The Tech Guy, and I wanted to basically do that, like basically the version of The Tech Guy, where he would get calls and people and I, and uh, people would ask questions about tech and stuff like that, and I would and I would answer them live on air. And I kind of thought, well, the thing is with Niagara College, not a lot of people may not have tech problems that they would want to call to a radio station to, to uh, get to get answers for. Yeah. So I uh, so I expanded it to I guess you know what like let's let's go with a, a geek uh, oriented show because that's at least a little bit more broad and I can kind of get a, a larger audience with that. And then I had a co-host in mind uh, for it, and unfor- uh, when we found, like we had to submit like a 15 minute demo. For to be for the station to be able to pick the seat, like they would choose uh, the best demos who would get on air. Right. And uh, I originally was gonna like I submitted it and I asked a friend of mine who was gonna be uh, was gonna be my co-host. And because of the scheduling that they had, they they wanted us pretty much on air within a week. I had to choose a day uh, that unfortunately just did not match his schedule, so he had to basically drop out. And then I thought, well, what? Uh, do, maybe doing it alone, but I thought, you know, I w- really want to do a co-host because I really like the conversation style. Uh, with when I, when I, uh, whenever I ha- talk with my friends, it's more fun to be able to talk with friends about geek stuff than it is to talk about it yourself. So I I knew Mike uh, Mike Dodd. He was he wanted I was going to ask him to be a, g- a guest co uh, guest co-host on the show. I wanted to have him on as like uh, basically the comic book expert. I wanted to have like experts on the show of like comic books, video games, movies, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And then I would just kind of conduct an interview style format. Right. And so I knew, my, and Mike was said he was interested in being the comic book expert. And then when I found out that um, my original co-host said he couldn't do it. We, uh, I was like, I basically woke up that morning. I was like, you know what? What the hey? I'll just ask Mike. He said he was interested, so I figured, uh, like, I, I thing is, I didn't really know him. I, I barely knew him at all. 
I've seen him around in, like in class and stuff like that, but I barely knew him. I uh, barely even said two words to uh, to him other than when he said he was interested. And then I asked him, I was like, hey, you know what? Just you want to be a co-host on my show? And he's about geeks, and he says, yeah, sure. <laughs> and so we literally like with after after first meeting for the first time, we actually went into the studio, recorded a promo. Uh, and then, like two days later, we were on air for our first show, and it was like instant chemistry. It was as if we like people had were comment uh, commented on uh, our first show. As basically, it seemed as if Mike and I were friends for years, and it was weird because we only knew each other for two days, and it, we just got along so well, and it just kind of grew from there, so to speak. Yeah, that was actually going to be one of my next questions was, how did the snowball hit the Birdman in the face? <laughs> because because he told me a little story about he tried to get you kicked out of school. Oh, yes, this one, this story, yeah. Now, this I didn't know until uh, at least about a few months after uh, we started doing the show. It was <laughs> it was kind of funny. I, I, we, had this, uh, we had to do this project um, – uh, for it was basically I think it was a broadcast journalism class where we had to take a new story and we had to basically report not necessarily report on it but kind of give our own perspective on the story like tell what the story is mm -hmm. and uh, ask que like get questions about like to kind of lead a discussion in the class for this new story right. and there was one particular news story uh, it was for Brock University which is uh, which is the local university in St Catharines and it was uh, a hacker had hacked into their system and stole 250 credit card uh, credit card numbers mm -hmm. and I thought. Well, well, that's perfect because it's right in my alley. I like hacking and stuff like that. And the thing is, I had a friend of mine who ran his own podcast called Hack Five. It's H A H A K Five, and they're at H A K Five dot org. And they actually invented this thing called the USB switchblade. And it's basically it's a, a, any of the new USB uh, USB drives have a technology in it called U3, which basically allows it to whenever you plug in a USB key, uh, if, if you can have it so that an application can automatically open up as soon as you plug it in. Same, they do the same kind of technology in like when you plug in CDs and into and, and your computer and stuff like that. Uh, and so my friend uh, Darren, um, who was basically who made this switchblade, he figured out a way to be able to create a uh, hidden. Uh, program that would launch, and what it would do is if you, um, it would uh, log, it would basically any, it, you, would be, you would plug it into the into your computer, and un uh, within a few seconds, unplug it again, and then any time someone else plugs in a USB key to that computer, the software, there's software that's hidden in the background that will automatically grab all those files and then email them to any particular email address you want. And so what I did was because I, I kind of used that as an example. It's like how easy it is to hack something. I actually cre I actually made my own USB switchblade and actually plugged it into the school's computer. Now the thing is, Mike wasn't in that. Mike wasn't in that class. We were all separated into into five groups, and he was in another group, and I was uh, than I was. But he found out this about a second hand. And I told the teacher that I was going to be doing this, and I said I can very easily remove the software, which was it was easy. It, was, it wasn't like it was going to be stuck on there for good. Right. And I I had that example. I actually had someone uh, basically plug in their USB drive, and then I actually had it so that the the uh, the, the all of his stuff on his USB would load up into my email, and it would and it worked. Well, somehow I, I found out about this. That Mike found out about it, and he was kind of he kind of uh, prided himself on being a hacker himself. So he he found out that I did this, and I basically trumped him. He got really really pissed off, and he actually wanted to be able to go to my program coordinator to try to get me kicked out of school. I had no idea this was going on, and I don't know whether or not he he if he did it or if he talked to anybody at all. But apparently he was pretty pissed off at me, and he, and he wanted to, he wanted to face from what he told me he wanted to hit me in the face. <laughs> well, what he told me the story was he thought that you were stealing test answers. I mean, oh, and, it's, and, I never knew about that. And, and first of all, he said, first of all, congratulations, but second of all, fuck you. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Did, yeah. Um, now, for me, podcasting came about. Uh, this is in, this is in uh, coincidence with my next question. For me, podcasting came about from listening to podcasts. And the question I had asked Mike was, did listening to podcasts get you into wanting to do host them like it did with me, or was it something else entirely? Uh, well, with me, it was, I have a, obviously, you know, I was very similar to, uh, your, uh, stance on it and the fact that, um, I was, I basically, what I wanted to get, uh, when I got into actually podcasting was listening to podcasts. And my very first podcast I listened to was, uh, This Week in Tech, 
Uh, but it's obviously Leo Laporte again, and uh, you can find it at uh, twitch.tv is, is all the podcasts he does there. And it, I listened to, I started listening to that, and I listened to a whole bunch of others. Like a, um, it was all within like 2005. It was pretty much that whole year was just listening to a whole bunch of podcasts. And I had an iPod at the time. It was basically an iPod third generation, and I would love just putting them all the podcasts on there, and just da- like listening to it. Because I used to go when I go go to school, I would always go on a bus. And the thing is, it's about an hour bus ride, so I would always the I would always have that time to be able to listen to podcasts. So when when I started listening to that, I was like, you know what, I could do that. So I started up uh, like me being stupid. Uh, I decided to do a video podcast, um, which was so hard enough in and of itself. Uh, it's it's called, it was called Snowballs PC, and it stood for it was a stupid name. It was just basically stood for Snowballs Podcast, and uh, it was basically a, a podcast all about podcasting. It would teach you how to podcast and like the tools and and the, and the equipment and stuff like that, and. Um, so I, I started doing that, and then I did uh, that. Pretty much died pretty quickly because I just never. The thing is about podcasting; it's a lot harder to produce video, and it takes a lot more time. It's time consuming to be able to do video than it is to do audio. Oh, yeah. And I learned that I learned that lesson really quickly. Yeah, um, I already knew. I was like, uh, <laughs> no, I can't even. I can't even do a YouTube account other than to subscribe and watch videos, let alone upload videos. Forget video podcasting. Exactly. The, the thing is, I, I decided, like, you know what, just go full bore and just go right out out and just do video podcasts because I, I i originally thought my the appeal for anyone to want to watch a podcast of me was basically the fact that i was an albino so i thought that's ah, i'm interesting to look at that's pretty much about it um but it then i started like doing other podcasts i did a podcast with uh, alex albrecht of dignation um and then i did other podcasts with um uh, my friend darren again from hack five and jen cutter from open alpha tv uh, then I basically, then when I started doing Twig, it was, that was pretty much the, Twig is pretty much the longest podcast I've been, I've, I've ran with. Uh, <laughs> yeah. so we're going on, I think about just past two years now and it's, uh, it's still, it's going stronger than it was before. So yeah, it was pretty much just listening to all kinds of podcasts that got me into it. Yeah, that's the same thing that happened with me. And, uh, actually I forgot to call Mike out on this on our little interview, but, he had said in one of the one of your all's episodes about me getting into hosting podcasts because of Twig. It partially was because of Twig, but the main inspiration was from World's Finest Podcast, which is a podcast dedicated to reviewing all of the cartoons in the DC animated universe. So uh, okay. that's what originally got me into it. Uh, what is your favorite word? It can be curse word, whatever. It doesn't matter. Ooh, you know, you're going very James Lipton on me on this one. Um, I'm turning the tables on you, buddy. Yeah, Jesus, <laughs> like oh, like I'm used to, I'm used to doing this stuff. You know, I had a word and I can't. Oh, I'm trying to remember w- w- what it was, but uh, uh, oh, you know, oh, you know what? I, I compl- I don't know why I didn't think about this right away. It, it's awesome. <laughs> yeah, I just think you use that plenty of times. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I use that. It, it's awesome. That's it's pretty much my my favorite word. What is your least favorite word? Uh, it, it's it has to be, it, like it's it, it's basically a tie. It's it's either the word moist, or it's the word macaque, which is the monkey. <laughs> I hate that word. I hate those two words with a passion. <laughs> um, I forgot. I had already I had asked Mike about this a long time ago on Twitter, and we'll talk about Twitter in a little bit. Um, where did your nickname come from? Oh well, it, it, my nickname Snowball started off with uh, like I was. I'm not gonna lie, I was picked up like probably like a lot of geeks out there. I was picked on a lot when I was in school, uh, mainly because I was an albino. I had, like really thick glasses. I wasn't exactly one of the cool kids, and I was getting sick and tired of them of of people calling me names like albino or whitey or uh, snowflake or anything along those lines. And I, I I don't know why at the time I was really pissed off about so anyone calling me the word albino. Now it's like that's pretty much my like my thing is be calling myself an albino. But it, it, it's, uh, I remember when I was in grade six, uh, I was with uh, my brother and uh, our, our best friend. Like our best friend li- lived like literally two doors down from us, and that's going back to when we used to play. I used to play outside. Um, basically, I, at the time, I was like, you know what? I'm getting sick and tired of like getting 
called all these names. I just want to I want to like create a name that I can actually be okay with, and I I, I could actually say like okay, you can call me this if you want to call me anything, and I would and I'll be all right with it. And so I it was a whole bunch of the names like uh, that we came up with. It was like somewhere like Snowman or uh, like once again Snowflake or just uh, any of those lines. And then and then someone basically uh, th- thought Snowball. And I thought, you know, I, I originally thought the name Snow, basically Snowball, and I had this picture in my head. It's basically of a cartoon Snowball, basically in a huge like snowball fight, and he's basically being like a like a badass kind of like throwing snowballs at other people. And that's the picture <laughs> I had in my head when I heard the word Snowball. I was like, yeah, let's do that. And then it wasn't until I got into a teenager that I found out it was used in Clerks and. Uh, <laughs> it, let's just say, actually, it, it was a funny story. Side note. Uh, Kevin Smith actually came to Toronto just recently. Uh, he had a, uh, he did a, one of his evening with Kevin Smiths, and he also did a um, a uh, basically a, a screening of all his movies at the Bloor Cinema. And uh, he actually did a Q and he would do a half hour Q and A after each film. And I went there for the first night when they had cl- when they show Clerks and Clerks Two, and Jason Mewes was there and Kevin Smith was there, and I was actually in the literally in the uh, the second row, <laughs> and it was so cool to basically be there. And and after like I decided after the Clerks Two like to be able to stand up and actually confront Kevin Smith about the whole snowball nickname and i actually did i basically just said kevin smith uh, basically said sir i wanted to thank you for ruining my nickname and that nickname is snowball and the entire audience basically just erupted in laughter and and uh, so now now kevin smith knows who i am and i'm known as snowball oh that's funny um yeah. if there was one place you could visit in the entire world where would it be and why um, I would, I mean, I, originally I used to think, like, uh, used to think kind of abroad, and I would always want to go to England or Ireland or Scotland or l- anything, along, anything along those lines, but, uh, lately I've been wanting to really go to California, uh, whether it be LA, San Francisco, uh, San Diego, doesn't matter, like, anything along California, because it seems to be that there's a lot of stuff happening there, and, and I just like the warm weather and stuff like that, so, yeah, it would either be England or California. Cool. Um, if you had to pick one cartoon as your number one all-time favorite, what would it be and why? Oh, that's easy. Tailspin. Hands down, Tailspin from Disney Afternoon. There's there's so much going on with that show. It was it was they never dumbed it down for kids. The storylines were not like you know like a lot of cartoons back in that day was like it had like a, a like uh the like the moral of the day is that kind of and it was always <laughs> kind of an episode. But with Tailspin, it was it was different. They, it was kind of along the lines of like Indiana Jones and it had like a lot of adventure and and uh, and action and comedy and drama and it was. It was really, really cool, and that like that hands down, like I have to say that Tailspin just really squeaks by Darkwing Duck in that respect. Because I mean, they both were high up there on my list, but I have to say, if I had to put them in order, it'd be Tailspin and Darkwing Duck. Yeah, yeah. If you had to pick a number one all-time favorite TV show, like regular, like Twenty Four stuff like that, what would it mm-hmm. be and why? Old or new? Doesn't all time. What, what all the time, oh boy? If you had to pick one, if you, if someone held a gun to your head and said, "You need to pick a number one TV show, or else I'm going to shoot you," what would it be? You know, the cliche thing would be to say Star Trek: The Next Generation, but I would have to say right now, Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> it's close. It's close. Oh damn! I thought I was gonna hit it on the head. <laughs> was, no, I was actually thinking like there was two. There's two shows in my head right now, and Battlestar Galactica is one of them. And I'm trying to decide on which one. I, you know, uh, I'm sad that it's gone, but yeah, no, Battlestar Galactica would be one. I, you know, I, I'm gonna go for it. I'm just gonna say it, it might be controversial. I don't know, Chuck. Chuck for me right now. <laughs> Every episode since it came out has been my. It's been an ultimate awesome episode. It's been. It's geeky. It's action. It's got hot. It's got a, the hottest chick on television. <laughs> it, oh, it, it's just. It, it's. It's pretty much. Yeah. That. Uh, oh, you know. It's. It's tough to choose. You can't. I'm a TV geek. I, you can't ask me to choose one. <laughs> well, I am too. But I mean, you know, it's, it's the whole point of doing this is to get the the hard new, the hard nose questions done and see what <laughs> answers pop out. Oh uh, yeah, but no, it's like it, well, 
yeah, I have to say, like, as of, like, it, it changes over time. Let me, let me just say that. It just, oh, yeah. a lot of my, like, his favorite shows change over time. And, and as of right now, I have to say my favorite show would definitely be, uh, would definitely be Chuck. Yep. Um, what are some of your favorite comic books? Uh, well, Watchmen, pretty much right off the hop. I mean, that's, that's, that's always been uh, a favorite of mine. Uh, I love the, uh, Batman Hush series. Mm hmm. Um, that's, uh, I have, I have the, uh, trade paperbacks for that one. Uh, I love, it, it, it kind of has a special place in my heart for it, but it's the death and life of Superman and, or the death and return of Superman. Oh, it's basically okay, yeah. where, uh, basically obviously Superman gets killed by doomsday. Issue 75, and, the black issue. Yep. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and then there's. Uh, there, that's pretty much the th- top three. Uh, there is one particular issue that actually I have uh, that I have akin to. Um, I think it was Superman number six seventy five, something like that. I, I have it, but it's 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 on, it's on a shelf and I can't grab it, so I can't <laughs> see it. But what was cool about it was that the art, like the artist of uh, uh, of this of the issue at the time, uh, was fans of podcasts. And uh-huh. every and he actually had uh, on one particular panel where there was basically it's kind of funny how that happened, but there's this one panel where uh, there's a bunch of like teenagers stealing like looting stuff, yeah. and there was uh, basically on on each of the uh, each of these uh, teenagers there's this there you can see the logo for this week in tech you can see the logo for Command N which is uh, and also Hack Five. You can see all three of those uh, logos distinctly in that one panel, and the thing is, I'm friends with every single one of those people on each each of those podcasts. So, and I'm good friends with all of them, and it's it, it's just amazing. It's like ah, oh, super. I actually had to go out and get like I don't read Superman regularly issue by issue, yeah. but I had to go out and actually get that just so I can be able to have that and and say like, hey, my friends are in there, and <laughs> it, it, it was pretty cool. Yeah, I think I only have five comic books right now. I have the original four independent issues of DC vs. Marvel, and I mm-hmm. have the uh, last year's Transformers BotCon comic. Um, nice. Next question would be, are you a Marvel or DC guy, or do you prefer uh, more independent uh, comic publishers? Um, I'm a huge fan of like the like the way the independent publishers are doing like they're doing their stuff right now. Um, Dark Horse has always been really good for like Star Wars and and stuff like that. Um, Top Cow also uh, is a pr- is a pretty good. Um, I would have to say though, I, I mean, I love independent stuff, and but nothing draws me in more. It used to be DC, I because I mean I'm a huge Batman fan, um, and I'm a huge Superman fan. Green Lantern, all like it's just Green Arrow, it like all those pretty much were summed up my childhood. But lately, more for the character development has been Marvel, because uh, what got me back into Marvel was basically reading Civil War, uh, even though it was a huge event book and nothing really kind of changed, like changed after, especially Spider Man. Because Spider, the thing is, in, in Civil War, Spider Man reve- or Peter Parker revealed that he was Spider Man in Civil War. Like he revealed to the entire world, but then what happened was like as soon as Trzinski finished his fin- uh, his run on Spider Man uh, and another ser- another uh, um, or, or another artist or I can't remember the writer right now who actually did it, he, they retconned it and basically said, oh yeah, that whole thing about Peter Parker revealing he's Spider Man, yeah, that's all gone, it, like it doesn't exist anymore because all because of magic, and I'm like, <laughs> oh, you can't do that, but. No, it, no, I have to say right now. I mean, with the latest movies that have been coming out, I'd say like Iron Man, Incredible Hulk, yeah. uh, X Men, all that stuff. Yeah, I have to say Marvel right now. I said I said this in Mike's interview when we talked around. Uh, I said this may be controversial, but Marvel owns DC when it comes to movies. The only the only DC mm-hmm. movie that can touch Marvel right now is The Dark Knight. Other than that, Marvel owns the movie stuff. Well, I mean, that's that's the thing. It's like, yeah, I definitely agree. Lately, the Mar- Marvel owns as regards to movies because uh, they've always come out with really good, consistent uh, movies. Some are hit and miss here and there, but uh, there's a lot more hits than there are misses with Marvel. Uh, and I, yeah, I agree. Yeah, DC with Batman Begins and Dark Knight, those two were, were really high up there. 
Um, but the thing is, the thing is, DC used to rule the roost back at like back in the day. I mean, yeah, I remember oh, yeah. we had 1989's Batman. We even had like even before that, a decade earlier with the Superman movies. Yep. It was just the, like those were like the iconic movies of all time. Yep. And it's just it, it just sucks that, that right now there's the DC DC is lacking and behind. And I really hope they can be able to like build something up and build a because with the success of the Dark Knight and uh, like they need to build something up new and something cooler. And they did really be able to kind of put Marvel in its in its place, and I think a lot of that has to go with Warner Brothers because Warner Brothers hold the franchise like the, of DC for like the longest time, yeah. and um, and I really think that if if DC can be able to create its own studio like Marvel did and just only allow the Warner Brothers to distribute the movies, that I think they could definitely be able to do a really good job with it. And it just sucks that it's basically stuck with Warner Brothers brass that they're not allowing people to be able to create the movies that we want to see, yeah. which. I mean, the good thing is they gave Christopher Nolan a, a free reign to do whatever he wanted with the Batman f- franchise, and I hope that um, that the brass of Warner Brothers are kind of really kind of lightening their their tight grip on the DC universe and maybe try something new. And uh, and I don't know, I, I like I remember those the what the Green Arrow was or uh, no Green Horn, uh, Green Lantern was going to do it was going to be a movie. And now that's gone. The Superman was going to do another Superman Returns sequel, which that Superman Returns sucked. Yes. It was good, but it was boring. Like Superman you know, Returns was a heaping pile of dog shit. That's exactly what it was. Yeah, I, I mean, it was Superman Returns. It was uh, it was an okay movie for what it was. I mean, it was it was a good attempt by Brian Singer to be able to bring back the uh, uh, obviously the Man of Steel, and it worked. But the thing is, though, what really kind of irked me a lot in that movie was you have an entire you have a movie about Superman. Superman does not throw one punch <laughs> in the entire movie he does not throw one punch all you see him is fly you see him lift stuff yeah. that's all you do <laughs> you don't see him do anything else the, the problem like, that's not super go ahead that's no i was saying that that's not superman because it's like superman you gotta fight you gotta fight something you gotta punch and have people go through walls and stuff and just, <laughs> oh, oh yeah it just all oh, that that irked me a lot other than Kevin Spacey and Brandon Routh as the as the two main characters. The mm-hmm. problem with Superman Returns is number one the writing, because mm-hmm. they made Superman into a stalker. That's what they did. Exactly. Sorry, exactly. that's exactly what they did, and it just doesn't work. And yeah, anyway. and Superman in a hospital bed? No, that never happens. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I mean, in the ER, that does not happen. <laughs> no, 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 no. Um. This isn't like a number one overall, whatever. But who is who are some of your favorite actors and actresses? Uh, favorite actors and actresses. Um, I mean, well, Samuel Jackson's one of them. Uh, I, I always enjoy seeing any any film that that he's really in. Um, wow, uh, I'm trying to think there now. Actresses. Um, I like Elizabeth Banks. Uh, she's always she's always pretty uh, really good. Um. Ooh, jeez, you're putting me on the spot here. Uh, I, like, I, the thing is, I have like a whole list, and it's like, oh, uh, Michael J. Fox would be one as well. Um, uh, uh, Jack Nicholson, um, Tom Hanks, uh, always been uh, always been a favorite. Um, I actually do like. Um, oh shoot, I had the name, and in, 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 oh, uh, I do like Tom Cruise to a certain degree, like his earlier stuff. Yeah. Was really good. Not so much his later stuff because it's just he, before he gone crazy. Um, Other than the Mission Impossible stuff, I don't like any of his newer stuff either. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I I agree with you on that one. Um, oh, uh, Greg Grunberg, love it, love it, uh, love him. Um, Bria Grant from Heroes, she's I I, lo- I love anything that she's in. Uh, yeah, no, it's just tough to, to, to decide. I I don't know. I have a whole list and and. Uh, like Patrick Stewart, Will Wheaton, like it's, hell, anything along those lines. Like Le- Leonard Nimoy, Zachary, Qu- like Zachary Quinto. Like I, I can't choose. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're not even gonna get into a heroes discussion because that's just gonna be a huge debate. Oh boy. I hate heroes. <laughs> Zero. I like it. Like I it. Anyway, um, switching gears a little bit. Mm-hmm. What do you think of all this social networking stuff? 
like MySpace and Facebook and Twitter. Twitter is awesome. <laughs> wait, 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 MySpace still exists? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah no, you know what? Same way I am too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, my the thing is, my I'm not in the really like knocking MySpace is 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 pretty easy to do nowadays. But uh, I mean, as far as your own personal profile on MySpace, yeah, it, it it's it, it it's pretty crappy. But uh, as far as bands and stuff like that, it's really good for that. Oh yeah, that's uh, all I use it for. Exactly. For musicians and stuff like that, it's perfect for it. Um, Facebook, I'm kind of starting to lose interest in it uh, just because it, it's uh, of the apps. I really hate the apps. I, it was stu- Like I remember I, I was on Facebook bef- when they were just uh, like doing it for colleges, and that was it before they opened it up to everybody. Yeah. And uh, so I, I, I loved it then. And I think, I, I think though, that pretty much I, I – right now, I constantly use Twitter. I mean Twitter for me is like the – it's the perfect place to be able to kind of put your thoughts out there and people can respond to you like pretty much right away. Yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's better. It's kind of like better than instant messaging and email and it, it, like all and kind of uh, a blog, micro blog kind of rolled into one. And it's as far as my thoughts on social networking, um, there, there is a few things. There's, I mean, it's not exactly perfect. Um, Twitter's obviously never perfect. Facebook, uh, Facebook's never perfect. MySpace is definitely not perfect. But um, there's, there, I do have some negative things to say about uh, social network networking. But with in regards to my life and my own personal life, social networking has um, impacted my life within the past year and a half to two years more, uh, more so than any other uh, thing online and. It's pretty amazing. I mean, I got to, like I got to go to at Dragon Con in Atlanta because of Twitter. Um, I've gotten uh, I basically got a, a huge fan base of my book for uh, for podcast novels based off of uh, Twitter. Um, I've actually uh, like uh, I've been invited to several to speak at several different uh, conferences because of Twitter. Uh, it's, it just, been, it's something I'm passionate about and something that I really think is going to, is going to, like, obviously it's going to evolve over the years, but this allows me to be able to connect with friends and, uh, connect with new people on a global scale. It, uh, really it pulls in the fact that, like, it's a small world after all, and it really is starting to become that way. Like, at any given time, I can be able to talk to a friend in England, um, or someone for, or, uh, someone from Australia. It's just, it's gotten to that point, so... Yeah, it, it, like it, it, I just love social networking and what it can do for not only just brands, but also for your own personal life, and uh, it's definitely impacted me quite a, quite a few. Oh yeah, I'm I'm the same way. Um, Twitter is just awesome, and uh, your little response uh, a few about a month ago about some article you posted by a famous uh, Canadian radio station DJ uh, yeah, yeah yeah that he has no idea what it is, and yeah that. Let's not even go there, but it's just mm. so awesome, especially since I found TweetDeck. TweetDeck is almost instantaneous. It is mm-hmm. it is just like instant messaging on Twitter. Like it pretty much is. Yeah. Whereas like the website or some of the other like the like the Twitterific Premium on the iPhone, you know, mm-hmm. you have to refresh it and it'll come up. But TweetDeck it goes through instantly. Mm-hmm. You know, and it's just instant access and it is just all kinds of awesomeness. Yeah. Now I would. Uh, now I know that you're on a on a PC, but uh, uh, it sucks that you're on that because I found literally a, a, an app that's even better than TweetDeck, and unfortunately it's only on the Mac right now. Uh, it's, I, it, I, I talked about it actually because I I uh, blog professionally over at uh, TechStartups.com, and I uh, wrote a post about it. It's actually it's for a program called Nambu, uh, N A M B U, and it literally has everything you would want in Tweet or that you have and and love in TweetDeck. But it does so much more. Like I, I would have to say, there's a post on t- TechStartups.com. It explains everything of what I love about it. And it, it sucks. Like I said, it, it sucks, Mike, that you're on a that you're on a PC. Uh, but I mean, TweetDeck is still still just as good on a PC, and it literally has almost everything that Nambu does. But Nambu does a few things a little bit more that uh, <laughs> that I love uh, than TweetDeck. Because I I'm not a huge fan of TweetDeck. I'm going to be honest. I mean, I, I like it to a certain degree, and it does definitely do quite a few stuff. Uh, but the thing is, with TweetDeck for me, it was always because I have uh, so many um, 
people that I follow and so many followers that are following me, anytime I, I like try to use TweetDeck within an hour, it, I would always run out of the API uh, refresh. So I would always have to wait another hour to be able to get updates in TweetDeck. So I would always have to quit it and go back to the web. But with Nambu, doesn't do that. I don't know how it does it. I don't know how it accesses the Twitter API or something, but because it, it doesn't have that whole 60% like you can whatever or how many uh, API requests you can send. It just somehow does it automatically. And I haven't had a crash on me since. And it's just a really, really good program. Mm, that's cool. Yeah, I I try to keep the people I'm following under 100. I don't, I don't want to end up being one of those people that's, that's following 4,000 people and I have three, four, five thousand 5,000 followers because it just slows. It's hard to keep up with a lot of them. Mm-hmm. No, it's understandable. I mean, right now I'm following uh, uh, 720 people, but generally it's it's those are the people that actually would respond back to me. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, I, like I have fourteen hundred and fifty four followers as of right now, but um which twitter dot com slash Steve Saylor. Anyway, but uh, no, it's, it's <laughs> it, it, like I keep I used to think the same way. Like I would keep it at a low number, the people who follow, so I can be able to keep an update like on all my friends. But it's gotten to the point now where it's like I, I don't really need that anymore. Um I can basically kind of like just take a look at Twitter and just kind of like uh, scroll through the latest updates, and then I could basically if I find something interesting, I'll go even further back into it. But um, as I mean, it's just good for me to be able to just kind of get a, a quick check the quick pulse of Twitter, so to speak. And um, it's I just like it that way. I mean, I don't want to follow everything that uh, people do, but it's it's just one of those things. It's just I just I, it doesn't it doesn't matter to me anymore how many people I follow. But I'll I, like I'm gonna say this right now. If you if you at reply me or DM me in Twitter, I will resp- I will follow back. That's the thing. I, I, if you're if you're conversing with me, then it's 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 my duty to basically follow you back because you take the time out to to ask me a question or talk to me or send me a comment. Yeah. It, it's my duty to to respond back. So I'm gonna follow you. Yeah, so. I mean, a lot of people I talk to on another forum site that I'm on Earth Two dot net, uh, they think it's like well, you know, the same same close minded type of deal that uh, that nameless radio DJ has like. Oh, it's just you know, it's a good way to stalk people, and it's a, it's just something you know. I really don't want to know you know what you're doing every second of the day, and mm-hmm. I find I don't, I am not posting on Twitter every second of the day. I'm not posting mm-hmm. every little thing, you know. I, I I may post something after we get off this little interview here and say, hey, I just recorded an epic interview with with at Steve Saylor, and. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I may go to sleep and then wake up around 9 o'clock and say, hey, you know, I'm getting ready to record another interview or, you know, you know what I mean, or record something else. It's not like, you know, it's best example I can give and people are going to have to search for this. Uh, maybe I can put it in the in the the, the video link in the uh, in the Predacon Empire dot com forum thread for this uh, this little interview here. Uh, trouble with Twitters or Twubble with Twitter, oh, whatever it is. That video Twubble was, with Twitter, yeah, that, that, that video was that, hilarious. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> I definitely agree with that one. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing with with Twitter. It's 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 kind of gotten, a, a, I guess, a, somewhat of a, a a bad rap for. I mean, even at the radio station I, I interned at AM six forty, when I, like they're now starting to get on Twitter. And the thing is with Twitter, it's they can, they think Twitter is it sounds like a bad word. <laughs> uh, it's it, because they think that basically people who are who are on Twitter are twits, yeah. and obviously people think that twits are a bad word. And it just and the thing is the audience for AM six forty is like. Like adults, any uh, thirty-five to fifty-four. So uh, like they're just ad- adults that don't really get Twitter, and I it, I slowly started to, to to convince them about it, and and but the, then it got to the point where it's like you know they don't really understand, like they don't like they just don't like it, they don't want to really mention it, and I mean they're starting to slow, like it, it's slow, and that's the thing with Twitter, it's like you got to be patient with it, yeah, um, yeah. especially like you can't just jump on the huge bandwagon and and expect it to all of a sudden like get the all these massive replies to anything you say. Right, you got exactly. like it took me. It took me two years to be able to get up to the point where I'm at right now. So yeah. it's, it, I'm you just gotta be patient with it, and then oh, yeah. eventually you find a need that that fits you. That's pretty much what I'll say. Yeah. One last question before I let you go. Um, if you had to give anyone, like any potential podcasters, advice on starting podcasts, what would it be? And what I mean, what would you tell somebody that wanted to start up a podcast of their own? Well, the thing is, uh, like, I kind of akin this to uh, also being uh, being a geek as well. Um, is 
uh, my definition of the word geek is being uh, being passionate about one particular topic. If you're a uh, a car geek, normally people will call them car nuts or uh, yeah. or uh, nut jockeys or whatever. And but the thing is, uh, you are if you if you think about it, you are a car geek. You learn about every new car that's coming out. You know the parts. You know every you know the, your car inside and out. You're a car geek, and it's like you could be a knitting geek, you can be a a, a toy geek, you can be a comic book geek, it's just anything along those lines. And and it's the same with the podcasting. Um, like it's it's whatever like whatever you're passionate about, that's what you should do a show on. It's because the best quote I've, I've been ever I've ever heard um, is from David Lawrence. Uh, he used to be a radio uh, a radio show host in, in California, but uh, a tech radio show host. But now he's actually he was just uh, did a guest star. Um, uh, stint on heroes but he he basically said at one point if you're interested you'll be interesting and that's the thing i always, uh, that's the kind of a quote I, I live my life on is that if, if i'm passionate about something if i'm interested in a particular topic people are going to find that and basically they're and they're going to think that you're interesting and they're going to want to listen to you so if you if you if you're passionate about um like baseball cards do a baseball cards podcast uh, if you're passionate about uh, if you're passionate about uh, music, do a music podcast. Just whatever you like and you know a lot of, there's guaranteed there's other people that are exactly like you that they're going to want to learn uh, learn more about it and be able to kind of converse with you. And so that's what I would say. Do exact. That's my ultimate best advice is do whatever is passionate, whatever you're passionate about, and basically it's and also to be patient too. It's passion and patient. Uh, patience because you gotta be uh, you're not don't expect to be basically be a hit right out of the gate yeah, it's gonna exactly. take you a while to be able to get good it's gonna take you a while to be able to kind of build up your audience uh like it's it took two uh twig two years to be able to get to where we're at right now and by all, me by all means we're not a huge podcast but i mean we're st i mean we uh, like we're basically a medium-sized podcast at this point but still you got to be patient you got to be still passionate about what you do and if you produce good content uh being passionate about what you're doing and you're patient with it yeah you guaranteed you'll get a huge audience yeah, yeah, that's that's the other thing. That yeah, that that's the same thing with me. When I started TFG One, those first six regular where I'm reviewing the shows, the, the cartoon shows, the first mm -hmm. six or seven, eight or nine episodes are like really rough because mm -hmm. uh, it. First of all, one man shows suck. <laughs> oh, I agree. I agree. If you can get yourself a co-host, it's always much better because oh, yeah. uh, I I tried doing it slow, uh, solo and and like guarantee. Let's just say Twig would never would be nowhere right now if it uh, if I didn't have a co-host like Mike because oh, exactly. it, it's the conversation that kind of draws people in. That's that. I mean, I've always I've always had that. Uh, as a saying is like if you, if you have a podcast and you can and you have a best friend who's in the same stuff you into the same stuff you are. Do it. Do a, a podcast with him, because or him or her, because it, literally it was. It, it's the best way to build. It, it makes it more fun for you too, because it, it really allows you to be able to. Like, it doesn't feel like a burden to be able to do uh, do a podcast on your own. It's like, oh, I gotta record a podcast. But if you have a friend doing it, it's basically like recording like your uh, your uh, conversations as you normally would have anyway. So why not record it and make it into a podcast? It just makes it more fun for you. Oh yeah, exactly. Um, this actually just popped into my head. How did Twig jump the shark? <laughs> oh god! <laughs> Wait, are you talking about the show Jump the Shark yes, or? Yes, yes. Uh, I, I was combining the two. <laughs> right. Okay. Uh, well, I don't think we've jumped the shark as of yet. Uh, although Dave's uh, Double D's rants have become uh, are getting to that point. <laughs> we, uh, like it's getting to the point where we're not even sure where Dave's gonna cut. Like, come, like, like he, he, we're, we don't even know what he comes up with anymore. It just it's at the, it's at the point where it's like we think we have an idea, but he just kind of throws something that's completely off the wall, and we we just don't even like bother even telling him what to do. He's basically you know what, just go nuts and do whatever it is you want to do and. He, he's kind of become that, but he's still just as awesome as ever. Dave uh, needs to go out to California, out to Hollywood, to see if he can get himself some voice acting gigs because he is an <laughs> awesome voice actor. He, he definitely is. He, his uh, Arnold is almost spot on. <laughs> yeah, like it was funny because uh, him and I, like we're like uh, we're kind of uh, known at least in the in our area for doing like a lot of like the voice stuff. 
um, and uh, me more kind of so for like narrators and and stuff like that. And I can do certain I could do definitely do kinds of voices. But him and I were actually looking into pursuing a voice acting career uh, professionally. And uh, yeah, him and I we love doing voices and the, the best time like I, we've never actually recorded this, but the best uh, uh, the best com- uh, conversations we would ever do is anything Dave and I we would do uh, the Arnold impression together. Uh, <laughs> basically, just he would do his and I would do mine, and it <laughs> we would always have tons of fun doing that. You guys have to record that for Twig. I think yeah, you know what I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, now I'm thinking about it. I think I want to pitch it to Dave. It's like Dave, you know what? Let's record a, a rant where basically you and I are doing our Arnold, Arnold voices, and I think I, I think that would be tons of fun. Do you have um, anything that you want that you want to tell us about as far as upcoming for you or upcoming for Twig? Um, I know Mike said he's gonna be traveling a lot. Um, yeah, he's going to be traveling quite a bit uh, because he's obviously doing stuff for like the Game Heroes and and for Twig and stuff uh, as well. As far as me, um, I'm I'm basically kind of become the uh, the the main host of uh, Twig DVD commentaries, uh, which I'm loving to do. I love doing every uh, those every single week. Um, uh, obviously, I'm doing uh, Jump the Shark, uh, running that on Twig right now, and I also run the website of uh, This Week Geek And um, as far as uh, personally, I mean, I'm looking uh, basically looking into doing some voice stuff. Um, I just got asked to um, technically audition, but kind of asked to be able to be a part of an, uh, another Star Wars uh, fan uh, audio drama because uh, I used to, I, I did one uh, back last year called Star uh, Star Wars. Uh, codenamed Starkeeper. It's run by uh, g- uh, another good friend of mine, Jim Perry. He, you can find it actually IndianaJim.net. Uh, you can find the uh, my little stint there. As basically, I was the main villain for that one, and because of that, I got this, I got asked to do another one. Um, so I'm gonna I'm looking forward to possibly doing that. Uh, Basically, I'm also going to be doing some more writing over the summer. Uh, I would expect uh, expect another podcast novel of mine. Uh, probably some. I, I hate giving kind of deadlines because I'm terrible at deadlines late, uh, lately for <laughs> podcast novels. But expect a new uh, a new one. Pro- I'm going to hopefully by by this year. Um, that's what I'm going to hopefully do over the summer. And, and um, yeah, so and then Twig is just still gonna, just going to go strong, and yeah. we're poss- got the cool stuff that I can't talk about right now, but. Uh, expect cool things coming up in the future. Yes. Uh, speaking of your writing, um, I have to ask since you brought it up, what mm-hmm. the hell do you do at Starbucks all the time? <laughs> <laughs> well, it originally was I, I used to go to Starbucks a lot to be able to like um, uh, to be able to write because I I, I, got, uh, I wrote my first podcast novel, Black Shadow, in Starbucks. I would bring my laptop and I would just go and sit there to write. It, it's weird for me; I can never seem to write at home. Uh, because there's too many distractions, uh, to, uh, that like obviously like watching DVDs, playing video games, watching TV, that kind of that kind of deal. But when I'm at Starbucks, when it's only just me and a laptop and the internet to keep me company, it, it can, at times it's basically the, it's the only this like that's the only uh, distraction I have, and and I can pretty much uh, just sit there and write. I, I've been able to sit there and for about two to three hours and be able to write like uh, 25 to five uh, 2500 to 5000 words within a given stint at Starbucks. So anytime that you, if you follow me on Twitter, anytime you see me saying I'm going to Starbucks, about 95 percent of the time it will be because I'm going to uh, going to be writing. Uh, it's just pretty much my place of choice to uh, to do that. Yep. Yeah, I do know of um, several uh, Twig uh, things that are coming up. You guys did get uh, blogged about on G4, and I had yes, we did. I mentioned to Mike. I said. Cool, Twig is gonna take over G4 now. At least it'll be a great network. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I would hope so. I mean, the cool thing is, is like, I, I mean, the best time of my life was actually working at G4 Tech TV here in Canada, because uh, I used to be the intern on Call for Help with Leo Laporte. Uh, hence why I, I, I like the guy so much. He's pretty much been my mentor for the past uh, two years, yeah. and. Um, I, I, I love I, I loved Tech TV back in the day. I was very sad when G4 bought it out, and I kind of wish G4 would be able to come back, bring it back to uh, the geeky tech side of things. But I know it's just run by Comcast, so there's not much I can do about that. But you know, uh, there's some things coming up that I can't talk about. I think Mike may have told you about as well. But there could be something more with G4 than uh, than more than meets the yeah, eye. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh huh. Um, no, I don't, I don't, I don't know if, I can't remember if he told me or not. It, it might be in his interview. I'm not really sure. Um, 
was the other thing I was gonna. Well, let's just say that if he had, if he hasn't mentioned it before, but yeah, there's there there's something that could that, that I can't say anything more. But uh, yeah. let's just say that uh, working being blogged on G4 is right now the first step. Ah, uh, uh, okay. So yeah. Well, I'd like to thank Steve for joining me on this special uh, interview episode. Um, this actually came about uh, su- Easter Sunday. <laughs> I, mm-hmm. I had taken a nap, and I woke up about uh, 3 o'clock, and Mike had Twittered that he wasn't doing anything. He was having a lonely, lazy day at home, so I sent him a message saying, hey, do you want to be interviewed? So that's where this <laughs> whole thing spawned out of, because I had nothing to do on Easter Sunday. <laughs> nice. So, um, yeah, I think we're going to close this one out. Thanks to Steve. Uh, no, thank you. It's been a pleasure. On. Um, hang on the line. I'll talk to you a little bit more off the air, so... No worries. All righty then. This has been the TFG1 Podcast Interviews.